Fetters mean something that holds us back. They hold back our progress towards the attainment of Nibbana. And the first one is Sakaya Diti. That means personality belief or um, self-illusion or self-delusion. The idea that we have a permanent self. This is a serious obstacle to spiritual progress. Not only is it wrong, but also it leads to um, certain complications. Having accepted that we have a, a self, a lasting, permanent self, we then have to cherish it, we have to look after it, we have to defend it. When people are nasty to us, we have to look after the self because we feel hurt. So, this leads to a lot of further complications. And this is a major obstacle to begin with, all we can do is not to take the five aggregates as a self, as something enduring. There will still be a subtle residue of this view until final uh, enlightenment. But at least to begin with, we can try to weaken the idea that there is a permanent or lasting self. The next fetter is skeptical doubt. We have to distinguish between two forms of doubt, kanka and vichikicha. Kanka is investigative doubt. There's something we don't understand. We investigate it. We come to a conclusion. We deepen our understanding. And that is thoroughly recommended. The Buddha said his teachings should be investigated. So investigative doubt is fine. But this is skeptical doubt. This is a state of mind in which we question everything and anything. Doubt about who was the Buddha, was there a Buddha? What about the Dhamma? Does this, is the Dhamma true? Uh, are there any enlightened beings, members of the Sangha? Uh, what was I in the past? What shall I be in the future? Um, what am I? How am I? Doubts about anything and everything. The Buddha said it's like being lost in a desert without a map. We don't know where to go. Shall I go this way or this way? You don't know. That's a serious obstacle. And so that is a fetter, can be overcome by the development of what we call sadda. Sadda means confidence based on knowledge, sometimes translated as faith. But this is not blind faith. This is faith or confidence that builds up as a result of our experience. When we see something is true, then we have confidence in it. Then the third fetter, Silabata Paramasa, the belief that the performance of some rite or ritual 
will have a certain effect. Remember, at that time, there were the people who performed ascetic practices, self-mortification, in the belief that that practice was going to have some purificatory power and that in the next life they would enjoy the fruits of this practice. You also had at that time the class of Brahmins, the priests who were the only people who had knowledge of complicated sacrifices. The destruction of large numbers of animals according to certain very clear and complicated rituals which were again believed to have some kind of beneficial effect. But the Buddha said that neither the repetition of holy scriptures, nor self-torture, nor sleeping on the ground, nor the repetition of prayers, penances, hymns, charms, mantras, incantations, and invocations can bring us the goal of nirvana. He, said, he likened it to, you come to a river, you want to cross the river, it's no good sitting down and praying. If you want to cross the river, build a bridge or build yourself a, a boat, and that's the way across. But you won't get across just by sitting on the bank and uh, hoping that you'll be able to go across. So, um, these... Well, <laughs> the Buddha also said that you know, we, some people have this idea that um, bathing can have a purifying effect. And the Buddha said, if bathing alone could make us pure, the purest beings must be fish. So these three can be eradicated. And that person is called a sotapanna, or stream enterer. This is the first stage on the path to what we might call uh, sainthood or enlightenment. The stream enterer, he's, he's entered the stream that leads to Nibbana. This means that he has now um, purified his mind to the extent that he cannot perform any actions which will lead to an unhappy rebirth. He can attain enlightenment in this life, but if not, he will be reborn a maximum of seven more lives. He has complete confidence no more doubts about the Buddha or the teaching. He has, sometimes it's said he's, he's had a glimpse of the attainment likened to somebody walking in the foothills of some mountains. Peak of the mountain is covered by cloud, but for a moment the cloud clears away. He sees the peak. And now he's confident. This path is going to take me up to the top. So even if the cloud comes back, he's still sure. He's 
on the right path. So this is a very important attainment. The Buddha said that 99% of the work has been done. He said what we have achieved is equivalent to the whole of the earth. The amount of work still to be done is like the bit of earth you can get on your fingertip. So it's a major uh, attainment. Could be. <laughs> Could be. It all depends upon the state of mind. If you offer flowers to an image of the Buddha in the belief that the Buddha has some kind of power which he can use to benefit you, then that indeed is the wrongful belief in a rite or ritual. The Buddha is long since dead. He has no power. He said, um, you yourselves must make the effort. Buddhas are only teachers. On the other hand, if you make the offering with the intention of purifying your mind and developing in your own mind the same qualities that the Buddha developed, that you're using the image as a source of inspiration or encouragement, then, although to an external observer there's no difference, it is in fact a, a helpful or beneficial action that you're performing. So it all depends upon your state of mind. Well, the, the Sri Mantra has purified his conduct to the extent to which he will not perform any unskillful actions which are serious enough to result in an unhappy rebirth. The Sri Mantra will be able to keep the precepts perfectly. Well, the precepts are there for everybody, but some people will keep the precepts and some people won't. The stream enterer will not break any precept. Okay? So then we move on to numbers four and five. Karma, raga. Raga means desire. Karma is the sense pleasures. Desire for um, sensory pleasures, which is the same thing as when the Buddha talked about uh, tanha, same as raga, karma tanha, when he was defining in, in the second noble truth the cause of dukkha. One form of tanha was karma tanha, and this is the same here, desire for sense pleasures. Number five, ill will or um, any kind of uh, friction, any kind of um, anger or resentment that is together with karma raga those two can be reduced but not eliminated by the next stage, which is the once returner, Sakadagami. The once returner will be reborn at the most one more time. He's not eradicated anything here, but he has weakened 
or reduced these two uh, fetters. And then the next stage, the anagami or non-returner, he eliminates both of these stages, these, these fetters, number four and number five. And so he is called a non-returner, which means that if he does not attain enlightenment in this life, he will not return to the human plane. He may be reborn in what are called the Sudhavasa, the um, pure abodes, which if you look at this chart on numbers 23 to 27, and enlightenment is attained from there. These things are all very relative, I think. <laughs> if, you, if you speak to an insect that lives one day and you tell that insect, you know there are beings that live 70, 80, 90, 100 years, the insect would say, you're pulling my leg and believe you. Um, so then we move on to the five higher or upper fetters. And he eliminates Rupa Raga, the desire to be reborn in one of the fine material sphere planes. These on your chart. If you think you would like to be reborn in one of these high planes, then that is a fetter. And number seven is similar. That is the desire to be reborn in one of the Arupa planes, which is the top four on this chart. So, if you wish to be reborn as some kind of um, highly developed being leading a life in a very, very pure state, then that is a fetter. That's why the Buddha said it is the human plane which is so important. Don't aim to be reborn in one of these higher planes. Arupa would be the four planes 28 to 31. Infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. These are all states of mind in which the, the consciousness, the chitta, is very, very, very pure. But although they are very pure, they don't last, so they're not the attainment of Nibbana. So it's not something like air that has no taste? No, these are states of mind. By taking as the object of meditation, the mind can, first of all, concentrate on infinite space, which means that the material object that was being used in the sense sphere jhanas, the material object is removed from the mind and a single point of light appears and this can be expanded to an infinite degree. So you are aware that space is infinite. 
The next stage is to be aware that the chitta, which is conscious of this space, is also infinite. So now you have infinite consciousness. By removing that, the meditator can then be aware of nothing. There is nothing. Nothingness. And finally, the chitta has become so fine, so pure, we cannot say that it is that there is any act of perception taking place. But you cannot say there's no act of perception taking place. So it's a state of neither perception nor non-perception. The analogy to explain this is the monk with the novice. And the monk says to the novice, Bring me the um, bring me bring me a bowl, and the novice brings the bowl and says, "But sir, there is oil in the bowl because somebody has wiped the inside surface of the bowl with an oily rag." So then the monk says, "Okay, if there's oil in the bowl." bring the oil tube and we will pour the oil from the bowl into the tube. So then the, no, the novice says, but sir, uh, there is no oil in the bowl. So <laughs> the amount of oil in the bowl is so subtle, you cannot say there's no oil in the bowl, but neither can you say there is oil in the bowl. So that's this very high uh, attainment. So we've looked at number six and seven. Number eight, mana. Mana, usually translated as conceit, superiority, thinking you're somebody very important, even in spiritual matters, we have this as a problem, as a fetter. Some people get conceited about their spiritual attainments. They think, oh, I'm a really great meditator. I sit for so many minutes or so many hours every day, with longer than anybody else I know, or I, or I keep more precepts than anybody else, and I'm somebody. Very important. But mana means measuring. And if you measure yourself against another and conclude that you are inferior, that is also a form of mana. And indeed, the third form is to measure and conclude that you are the equal. All forms of measuring are not helpful. Yes, we're different, but we don't have to engage in a lot of measuring. And then, number nine, restlessness. This is the state in which the mind is always moving on, changing, restless, not calm, not staying on one spot. This is a, this is a problem um, in all states of mind, but here it's given a specific um, mention as a fetter. The mind is lacking in um, calmness, peacefulness, and is restless. We sometimes talk about the, the monkey mind. That's like a monkey jumps up the tree and then across there and down there and across there. The mind is like that, going from one object to another. 
and then a uh, vidya. Vidya, vision. A uh, vidya, no vision. Not seeing. Not knowing. Ignorance. This has a specific meaning in Buddhism. Not just ignorance of, of how to um, repair your car. It's ignorance of the way things really are. The Buddha gave us these three characteristics. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Impermanent, unsatisfactory, devoid of a lasting soul or self. When those higher fetters have been uprooted, then we have the fourth attainment, which is arahant, or enlightened being. That is the goal. I think maybe a little tea break at this point to celebrate our attainments. Well, there are different ways, different teachers teach different things. I think traditionally it was said you practiced samatha meditation up to a certain level and then you could change to practicing vipassana meditation. You could practice samatha meditation until you attained the fourth rupa jhana. You didn't have to worry about the arupa jhanas. You could go into vipassana meditation having attained the fourth rupa jhana. But other teachers say, no, you do not need to attain states of jhana, that you can develop what is called kanika samadhi, momentary concentration, and momentary concentration is sufficient for the practice of vipassana meditation. So you don't have to go up to the fourth rupa jhana. So there are different teachers teach things differently. I think the Buddha's explanations that he gives in his suttas are, um, are open to different interpretation. And I think some meditation teachers, based upon their own experience, teach one thing. Other meditation teachers teach something different. So there's no absolute inflexible rule here. Momentary concentration. concentration. Sorry, don't you then need to take an object for vipassana? No, vipassana meditation is watching. Yes. Yeah, so what do you watch? You watch either mental or physical experiences and sensations. So you can go back into anatta, or you can go into anatta. Yes, or you can just look at the mind and watch the changing nature of the mind. One kind of mental state or thought arises, hangs around for a while, then it disappears. Then another one arises, hangs around for a while, and disappears. You will not find anything there which is permanent. You will not find anything there which is giving you lasting happiness and you will not find anything there indicative of a permanent soul or self. You have to have some degree of concentration. If you don't, the mind is going all over the place and you just don't go anywhere. You've got to be able to hold the attention on whatever it is you are using, the, if you like, the torch to shine on something. You can't just have the torch going all over the place. So it, even if you don't attain the states of jhana, 
you still have to have a minimum level of concentration and that is for some people call kanika samadhi momentary concentration yes and we, we, we can only eliminate them or reduce them by meditation practices and so these are stages along the path towards enlightenment they're all mental stages mental attainments but of course many people have to live in the mundane world and indeed even the Buddha lived in the mundane world when he was giving sermons and walking around and talking to people he had to be able to live in the everyday world but it's also possible to set aside time in the day for meditation practice which is what he did certain times of day or night he was able to practice different forms of meditation so he became adept at them so I don't think it's a case of either or you can have both the, the, the three unwholesome roots of loba, dosa, moha are all present in one form or another in these fetters. So these are, um, put it the other way, if there was no loba, dosa and moha, there wouldn't be any of the fetters. Look at the Satipatthana Sutta, in which the Buddha describes this process. The first part of the description is samatha practice. Towards the end of that section, there is what is called the refrain. And this refrain crops up at the end of each of the sections in the Satipatthana Sutta. And the refrain, where you are aware of origination factors and dissolution factors, etc., that is the switch to the practice of vipassana meditation. So the Satipatthana Sutta describes both samatha and vipassana. If you take a look at that sutta, you'll see where the so-called refrain comes in. It's the last two or three sentences of each section. <laughs> 